Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is part two of our Falcon and Winter Soldier episode four open spoiler discussion. Now, of course, a couple days ago on Friday, we did part one of our Falcon and Winter Soldier episode four spoiler discussion. Went almost two and a half hours, but we did not get through all the questions, comments, observations, theories, and everything you guys sent in. So I told you we'd get them done this weekend, and that is what we're going to do. Again, let me just kind of emphasize something here. I have enjoyed Falcon and Winter Soldier. I've liked it. It's had a couple of moments that have been brilliant. But overall, I haven't been like in love with Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Uh, not like the way WandaVision completely captured my imagination. And, and I just had me chomping at the bit every single week to see the new episode. However, episode four may have been the best single episode um, of Disney Plus television we've seen so far. The episode was amazing. We talked a lot about uh, in, it in part one of this video, but now we're going to get into part two. And again, it's just going to be all taking the questions and comments, observations, and theories that you guys made during that part one live stream. But now we're going to get them all cleared up. So let's not waste any time and get right to it, shall we? We're going to start getting caught up here with Raymond Verada, who writes, this was brought up last week on Twitter. Where are the Asians in Madripoor? Uh, we've only seen three or four of them at the bar, none at Sharon's party, and none at the port. Well, I mean, yeah, I noticed that too, but at the same time, Madripoor is a fictional place. Like, it's not real. And who knows what the population of Madripoor is supposed to really make up. Like, I mean, if they were in Hong Kong, that would be one thing. If they were in Singapore, that would be something. But being in a fictional country that we really don't know much about other than its general location on the planet, it could be very, very different. So for me, I didn't really pay much attention to that part. Again, only because it's a completely fictional place. All right, next up, Raymond also writes, for this week, what's up with Turkish delight as a tempter of children? It was used also in Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Yes, it was. Turkish delight, the white queen offered, of uh, children. It was used also in Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Have you had it? Um, yeah, I mean, Turkish Delight, I've heard of it before. You know, it's funny you bring that up because two days ago, Anne and I went to Universal City Walk and they have a giant, giant candy store there. And Anne wanted to go in specifically to see if they had Turkish Delight because she had never even heard of Turkish Delight other than Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. They had none there. But yeah, it's just like this weird thing that pops up in fiction from time to time, Turkish Delight. But I remember as a kid having it, but like... I don't recall seeing it in candy stores since then, so it's a great observation, Raymond. All right, we move on here. Cinema Reviews writes, Bucky is a Winter Soldier. He's arm fall off boy. Man, how heartbroken and helpless did Bucky look like he felt when that had happened, right? It was such a good moment. It was really, really good. Murray Reich writes, At the moment where Walker is about to kill the guy, I thought out of nowhere Bucky or someone else would stop him. I kind of thought that's too in the moment. Uh, but wow, that, sh that was shocking and disturbing. Again, I said this on part one of the video, but I'll say it again here. The single image to me that embodies, you know, the MCU up until the end of Endgame is the image of Steve Rogers standing alone across from Thanos and his entire army, getting ready to take them all on by himself. To me, that's the image of the MCU between the beginning and the end of Endgame. That image of John Walker, for completely different reasons, standing there after he kills him with the bloody shield, that to me is the image of the MCU now. And that's disturbing. That's very disturbing, but it was what a powerful, powerful image, uh, Murray. Absolutely. All right, next up. I want to watch, he writes, when Battlestar was killed, uh, was like the good voice in Walker was killed too. So now he's out of his mind without control. Dude, I was kind of saying the same thing. I was saying that it's a double whammy for John Walker, right? John Walker, he has the most important person in the world to him. And he also has the person that when he needs somebody to hold him up, he's got that person. Now, the thing is, those two people were the same person. They were both Battlestar. So not only did John Walker watch his closest, most beloved friend die in front of him, but the person he would then normally in his life rely on and lean on in that time of pain and need was the same guy who died. And I, that's why, you know, I was saying when I was watching John Walker kill that guy, 
I was horrified at, at the one time because they made it very horrifying. But at the same time, my heart was breaking for him because number one, the pain that he was clearly in. And number two, you knew that this guy who deep down wants to be a good guy, wants to be a hero, wants to do what's right. You recognize that he is now crossing a line he can never come back from. And and that's why I thought that scene was so powerful, dude. I thought that scene was so powerful. All right, next up. Uh, Boosters of the name writes, finally, the John Walker I've been waiting to see. I think a lot of people, I mean, for, for obviously other than normal reasons, I think a lot of people would agree with you on that one, Booster. Uh, next up, Scott Brett writes, uh, John Walker is definitely not my Captain America. Steve Rogers would have never killed in cold blood like he did. Great episode, though. I mean, let's not forget and lose sight of the fact that Steve Rogers has killed people, right? Like all the way back in... Um, in uh, Captain America First Avenger, when they go through the montage of him and his troop going around and, and wiping out Hydra bases, we see them busting through the doors and Captain America with his gun shooting people. He's killing people. I mean, even go into uh, Winter Soldier. He was killing some people, but it was never a defenseless, defeated enemy who is now there at his mercy. Like, that's the line that, that Walker crossed that Steve would not have crossed. And that is the big difference. And that, uh, Erksel, I can't keep forgetting the name of the scientist who created Captain America, but that's what he was always worried about. You need the most pure of heart, the most noble of spirits to be able to handle the responsibility and the power that comes with super soldier serum. And that's the difference between Steve Rogers and John Walker and Steve Rogers and everybody else. So, yeah, that was... That was pretty hard. I mean, it was a brutal moment, but brilliant at the same time. All right, Christina B. writes, The pacing in the plot of this show feels like this should be a 20-episode season, not six. How do we only have two episodes left? Listen, I am. I was saying this the other day, too. It's like, when we were at this point in WandaVision, we had five episodes left. Like, after we got through episode four of WandaVision, we had five episodes still. We weren't even at the halfway point yet. We weren't even halfway through the show yet. And yet here we are after episode four of Falcon the Winter Soldier. We've only got two left, Christina. Two left. That's it. And I I feel you. This feels like this show should have another five or six episodes. But it's what we got. We got two episodes left. All right. One, uh, Giralas writes, When Walker slammed the shield on the thug, it reminded me of when Steve almost did the same to Tony. Key word, almost. And you know what, Juan? I don't think that was by accident. I think that imagery was very much on purpose that, you know, you have the one Captain America with his fallen foe in the same predicament as the other Captain America, fallen foe, beaten and defeated foe. What do you do now? Cap spares him, gives him a cell phone and says, you call me whenever you need me. John Walker I'd like to see your blood on my shield. They're coming out of slightly different circumstances. John Walker just saw these people, even though it wasn't this guy specifically, but it was still, he just saw these people, these flag smashers murder his best friend. Whereas Tony only tried to murder Steve's best friend, but still you're right. It is a great illustration of the differences between the two. One excellent observation, my friend. All right. Next up, Drew H writes, Holy crap, Sebastian Stan. That opening scene in Wakanda is now my favorite scene of the series. His performance in that scene was was moving. Listen, I first of all, I freaked out when you heard the Wakandan drums. It's like, oh my God, they're going to Wakanda. Six, and the little words come up six years ago. I'm like, sweet. And they go back there. And yeah, it's a good scene. But what makes it exceptional is Sebastian Stan's performance. That after nearly a century not quite a century, but nearly a century of being under other people's control, of knowing and being cognizant of the fact that you are a walking, ticking time bomb. To, for the first time since he can remember, like I said, in almost a century, he was free of it. And the emotion and the, uh, the, the all the the stuff that he was feeling just coming up in that surface. I'm telling you what, Drew, that was a terrific performance, really sold well by Sebastian Stan. I mean, listen, let's not overlook how great the caliber of actors they have in this show. Like, not only Daniel Brühl, who's probably the best of them. Daniel Brühl is probably the best actor in this show 
pure actor, but um, Anthony Mackie is an awesome actor. Sebastian Stan is an awesome actor, and they are really showing it off in this thing. All right, James Welsh writes, you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. I think that fits Walker. Uh, James, I think you're, that saying was created for James for John Walker. I mean, because up until this point, you know, he was what he was great at being. He was a soldier and apparently a great soldier and apparently by the people close to him, a really good man, just not the kind of good man on Steve Rogers level that could handle this type of pressure, these types of responsibilities the way he can. But you're right. It just seems like this, that, that DC line, you know, Dent saying you either, you know, die the hero, you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. That is the living embodiment right now of John Walker. That's a really good, that's very, very applicable, James. Very applicable. All right. Mario Mann writes, John Walker definitely has some sort of uh, mental problems from war. He ticks the ticks that he does. It almost seems like PTSD. And you know what? I don't think you're wrong about that. I don't think you're wrong about that. I think that does play a part of what's going on with him. You know, the, the dude has just seen so much and you could even hear it in his voice in the scene that happens before Battlestar dies. You know, John Walker and Battlestar, they're talking with each other when they start having the conversation about the super soldier serum and he starts talking about their time in Afghanistan and all that kind of stuff. And I think you just made a very, very good observation, Mario. I think... What they're showing to us is on top of all that, he's got wounds. Walker has wounds that are now festering. They're not in a good environment, these wounds. These mental, spiritual, you know, wounds that he has, they're now festering and they're turning into bigger problems. And I think you're absolutely right and onto something there. He just never had them. Maybe he never thought he had them or never he or maybe he just ignored them, but he never got them treated. He never like in any wound that goes untreated, it can fester and become even worse. So I think you're onto something there, man. All right, next up. Fanblaze7 writes, Sam and Bucky are going to see Cap on the moon, but instead of Cap, find Vector. Oh, there's a deep cut. From Despicable Me, the only person who can stop Mephisto. Oh, for this Vector from Despicable Me. Because if I'm not mistaken, Vector, is Vector not also like a member of the Thunderbolts? I could... I could be wrong about that. You said Vector, and I instantly thought of that one dude from the Thunderbolts. I think there actually, I think coincidentally, there is a character named that. But anyway, I like seeing you trying to cross over the uh, Despicable Me stuff in there. He's the only person who can stop Mephisto, and obviously Mephisto is the power broker, right? Like, we all know that, right? Mephisto's the power broker, clearly. All right. Uh, Garuv writes, Bucky DeZemo, you want to see what someone can do with leverage, what a line. Dude, that entire exchange... Can we just talk about that exchange, that entire exchange, that entire sequence of events that happened around that conversation? We're so gripping. Listen, I said a little bit earlier that I feel like this episode of Falcon and Winter Soldier was maybe the best episode of Disney Plus television so far because it had everything. It had twists. It had deep character development. It had philosophical conflict. It had terrific action. And it had an oh my God ending. It was a near perfect episode of television in, in a series that to me has been far from perfect. Like I said, I've enjoyed Falcon and winter soldier up till now. There are certain moments in it that have been brilliant, but this episode I believe was the capturing of the full potential of this show. Like I said, this episode had everything. It was a near perfect episode of television, at least a near perfect episode for this kind of television. I loved what they gave us and that whole sequence, including the whole line about leverage, man. You're absolutely right about that. All right. Rylan Holman writes, uh, how you view Hayward is how I view Walker. Great job by the actor. Yeah, Wyatt Russell is doing a fantastic job playing this character. He won't be capped much longer, but I want to see more of his character. See, I, and I, listen, I, to a degree, I do see him very much the same way I saw Hayward in WandaVision. Look, he's... He's a dude who wants to do right by humanity. His core motivation, he thinks, you know, the road to, to hell is paved with good intentions. He has the best of intentions in many ways. He believes he is doing the right thing. He believes he's acting. I don't see him as a villain per se, as somebody who's really lost their way. 
And I, now maybe, maybe Walker evolves into just a pure villain. Uh, right now, he's a dude who's lost and who's damaged and who needs a friend, but his best friend is now gone. But yeah, I, I totally see the, the correlation there, Ryland. I really do. All right, next up, we got Jay Meister 25 who writes, uh, tips in like $20 in the Super Chat. Thank you, Jay Meister, for supporting the channel on that level, man. Appreciate that. All right. I love Battlestar's position on power. He believed that power doesn't corrupt, uh, but that it enables who that person originally was. And I agree 1,000%. Power can make a person better or worse uh, than they were. Steve versus John. Right. But the, the, the difference is, Jay Meister, is... They don't see it the same way. And you know what? I'm, I'm just fed up with this. I got to go look it up again. Um, first Avenger IMDb. I keep forgetting Erkstein. Erk, Erk, what was the name of the Stanley Tucci's doctor? The, 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 the doctor Stanley Tucci played. Erkskin. Erskine. Okay. What Erskine understood was it can't just be a good guy. Right, the way Battlestar sort of sort of saw it um, was that, well, if you're basically good, it'll just make you more good, and if you're basically bad, it'll make you more bad. Right, the difference between a Carly and a Steve Rogers. What he didn't know was that Carly was basically a good person prior to all the tragedy and all the terrible circumstances and then taking the super soldier serum. Cause I even bet when they were getting the flag smashers going, I bet she wouldn't have blown up a building. I'm guessing that character, what we know of her would not have blown up a building with people in it, but now she's got the super soldier serum and it's making her do things. I think that she would not have done before, or it's at least influencing her to do things she wouldn't have done before. See Battlestar got the basic idea, but he didn't see it all the way through. It doesn't just make you a better person if you're basically good. The super soldier serum is going to find any character flaw in you. The super soldier serum will take that deepest, darkest part of you and make it more prominent and blow it up. And that's why Erskine was so determined to find the one right person. Because out of all those soldiers that were trying out to be the first Captain America, I'm sure many of them were good men. Maybe not the one dick that the Tommy Lee Jones wanted to pick, but out of all those American brave soldiers, I'm sure a good number of them were good men. But Erskine knew it can't just be a good guy. It has to be somebody of such pure character that they're going to be able to resist the shadowy influence, if you will, that he knew his super soldier serum could bring out in people. So that's why you're seeing John Walker, who prior to all this is basically a good guy with issues, but it's turning him whatever. Carly, who was just probably just a good girl, but it's now she's going down a slippery slope. I mean, so Battlestar got the basic idea, but he didn't understand it all the way like Erskine does or like Erskine did. And I think that's uh, part of the tragedy here. I think it's part of the tragedy. Anyways, thanks for sending that in, Jay Meister. Al Rensha writes, Hey, John, if Carly ends up killing slash attempts to kill Sam's sister and niece, niece slash nephew, I think they're both nephews, um, how do you think he would react? Would he lose control or be calm? I can't imagine him being calm. Like, I think all of us, including Sam, I think it would be bad writing for... Sam to get word that his sister and his two nephews have been murdered by Carly. And he just goes, well, you know, I, I feel really bad, but we can still save Carly. That would be bad writing. Cause that's, that's not how he would react. It's not how any human being in that situation would react. You know, it's kind of, look, is Tony just a straight up cold blooded murderer? no, but how did Tony Stark react when he found out that this guy he's standing beside, Bucky, is the one who murdered his parents? Yeah, I think if Sam walked into a room where Carly just finished snapping the necks of his two nephews and his sister, I think Sam and Carly are going to have issues at that point. So I don't think he would probably just handle it all nice and calm. 
Um, maybe, maybe at the end of the day, he'd with, withhold himself. If he had her beaten and defeated, maybe he doesn't execute her at that point. But I, I don't think he just handles it nice and calm. You know what I'm saying? All right. Anyway, Jay Meister, good question, Al. Jay Meister writes, also, the action in this episode was freaking brutal because it was so character driven and the sound editing has been uh, Emmy caliber. Listen, I'll tell you what. I always say this, Jay Meister, and you just pinpointed the heart of this thing I always say. Action without narrative purpose is just visual noise. You should, you should tattoo that on yourself. Action. Filmmakers should tattoo this on themselves. Action without narrative purpose is just visual noise. You know, I really like Ant-Man and the Wasp. But there's an action sequence near the beginning of the film when um, Wasp is going in to uh, make a, some sort of deal for tech when she's really just trying to get something anyway. And this big action sequence, and it's pretty cool visually, but there's not a, there wasn't a lot of narrative purpose to the action that was going on on screen. Uh, the same can be said for a lot of the action in tr the Transformers movies. There are some scenes that are very narrative-driven in their action, but there's a lot of just visual noise for the sake of visual noise. Action without narrative purpose is just visual noise. That's one of the reasons why, to me, the airport scene in Civil War is one of my all-time favorite action scenes because every one-on-one -on -one fight, every blow, every uh, strike, e everything was so soaked in story because you know the backgrounds of all these characters. You understand the circumstances they're in with the whole divide over the Sokovian Accords and all that kind of stuff. Some rushing to save the world, some rushing to save their team, all this kind of stuff. And everything that happens in that thing is like just soaked in narrative. Like even when, you know, Hawkeye um, and uh, and Black Widow are fighting, it's like, we're still friends, right? Like, like all, it just, and when it's soaked, and that's the thing about the action in this show. Every single scene has been soaked in storytelling. All the action has narrative purpose and is a result and an expression of the narrative that's happening. And that is what makes it not just great, not just a video game action scene, it makes it a part of the story. And when action can become a part of the story, a functioning, living, breathing part of the story, it draws us in way better, way better. And, and that's so I completely agree with, you, agree with you, Jay Meister. I completely agree with you. All right. Gabe Campbell writes, just finished watching it again. God damn, those last 15 minutes are intense. So good. So good. I mean, all the pain and the story twists and then the shocking moment that had me horrified and my heart breaking for John Walker all at the same time. It's just, it's bloody brilliant. I, again, it, this episode is the fulfillment of the promise that this show has. A fulfillment of the potential this show has in one episode. That's it. Let's hope that the next two episodes, Gabe, can carry that on as well. All right. Sean Stewart writes, um, where are we? Seems like the theme of this episode is restraint and choosing not to fight. John Walker, Carly, the Wakandan female guard all fight and lose their objective. You know, that's a good observation. Like everybody who just wants to rush in and make it a physical co conflict, they all seem to lose. The only time there was ever any kind of winning going on was when Sam was actually having his conversation with Carly. At both occasions, when he's actually able to talk to her, you know, and everybody else, the John Walker didn't get what he wanted, you know, the Dora Milaje didn't get what they wanted, and you know who else won and didn't fight? Zemo. <laughs> Zemo didn't fight, and he ended up winning. Uh, granted, he shot Carly, nearly murdered Carly. Which would have made him a hero in some ways, but I mean, but yeah, the, the, they're the ones. So that's a really good way to phrase that, Sean. Well done, my friend. Well done. All right, next up, uh, Dennis uh, LeCompete writes, those three MOH awards are, 
Medal of Honor? Oh, yeah, because he has medals, medals of Honor. Those three Medal of Honor awards are complete BS. Most who receive it die. It cheapens something special. Eh, you can't say that, Dennis. You can't say that. And the reason I say you can't say that is because you and I do not know the specific circumstances surrounding him getting those Medals of Honor. For all we know, remember, this is a fictitious character. This is all fiction. None of this is real. But for all we know... The way they write it, it could be the literal three most heroic things any soldier in history has done. I'm just saying we don't know. So we can't, you and I can't evaluate the worthiness of his medals of honor when we don't know, when we haven't been really made privy to other than a few, you know, implications here. But we really don't know what they're for. And maybe if the storytellers told us this is specifically what happened, we'd be going, oh, my God, wow, he should have five. I mean, but we can't say they weren't worthy or that him having them cheapens them when we don't know what this fictitious circumstance with this fictitious character has fictitiously done. Right. When we don't know that, we can't evaluate it. So I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to challenge you a little bit on that, my friend, Dennis. I'm just going to challenge you a little bit on that. All right. Next up, the Vegeta 90 writes. I believe the ending moment will push that PG-13 to its limit now with how dark that was. But it's still within PG-13, right? Like, we never saw the she... See, this is what I mean. I keep telling people, people don't understand how much you can get away with with PG-13. You can get away with a lot. And the very fact that that we did not see the edge of the shield split his ribs and, and bury itself into his body, you know... That kind of stuff, yeah, we, we might be getting into R-rated territory in that thing. And by the way, this is television. There are no ratings. I mean, you can say it's PG. You can say it's R. The reality is there is no rating. The MPA, the Motion Picture Association of America, they don't give television episodes a rating. There's a television board that, that can give different ratings, but that's all voluntary. So, but in our movie standards, if they had showed... The thing piercing his skin, cracking his ribs, burying itself into his arteries, into his lungs, and blood squirting out. Oh, eh, maybe then they would have been playing. But yeah, they were able to show something that was graphic, disturbing, and had a visceral impact on us, and it didn't need to be rated R. That's why I always push back when people say, such and such a movie has to be rated R. You, then you don't understand anything. Unless we're talking about porn. Because yeah, that, that's got to be rated R. I'll give you that. Uh, Anyway, but yes, it was powerful and visceral and disturbing and all that wrapped into one, uh, Vegeta. All right, next up, we're going to go to Marcus Walker, who writes, Walker's vice is his impatience. That's one of them, for sure. One, going to Latvia off the books. Two, taking the serum without oversight. Three, the very public killing of a smasher. Well, I, I I wouldn't write off the the murdering of the flag smasher to impatience that was not impatience that was raw visceral hatred this group just he just watched the murderer's friend he just watched the murderer's friend that wasn't about impatience that was about but you're right he he feels i've i've interpreted it and maybe i'm wrong as this pressing burning He has a need to prove himself. He feels. He feels he absolutely has to prove that he's Captain America. That he deserves that shield and that uniform. And the more he gets rejected, the more burning that need becomes. Like you remember when he first meets Sam and Bucky, he was very... Hey guys, isn't this great? Like there's a new Captain America. Uh, I'm John Walker, Captain America. Man, how great would it be if we all worked together? And by the way, he was right. How much could we accomplish if we work together here and go after these flag smashers and blah, 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 blah. But the more he gets rejected, whether it's by Sam and Bucky rejecting him, whether it's at that flag smasher safe house when the guy spits in his face and Walker's like, don't you know who I am? I do, and I don't care. Like, the more and more, or when he fights the Dora Milaje and loses, and he's totally disheartened, he's like, they weren't even super soldiers. Every rejection, every failure, 
makes that need to prove he's Captain America burn hotter and hotter and hotter. And uh, we see where it's led him so far. It's going to be interesting to see how much further uh, they make him go. Okay, uh, let's move on here. Next up. Um, that was Marcus, I think. Yes, yeah, Suthius writes. Kind of ironic, isn't it? Lamar and John were just talking about how everything would be easier with the serum. And what happens next scene? Lamar dies on John's watch while having the serum. Not so easy. Yeah. I mean, there were several things that were completely ironic and heartbreaking. Number one, the idea that, man, everything would just go great if, you know, one of us had the serum. Well, he did have the serum. And his best friend died. But the other big powerful, ironic kind of thing of this was that this flag smasher he killed, somebody else brought this up. One of the viewers brought this up in part one and it was, I didn't even think about it while I was watching it. The flag smasher John Walker kills just earlier that episode is talking about how Captain America is his hero. Maybe not this Captain America, but that Captain America was his hero and he died by the same shield his hero would carry. I mean, it's so much tragedy in there, man. So much tragedy in that. All right, next up. K. Munoz writes, one of three. I love how these Marvel uh, Disney Plus shows have allowed for so much complex character development. Absolutely. And not just for the protagonists. All the main players are doing what they think is right with the understandable motivations. Flag Smashers, Carly, uh, Zemo, Sam and Bucky, John Walker. You're absolutely right. None of them are just one-dimensional, right? There's many, many shades of gray there. You're right about that. Uh, all the main players are doing what they think is right and understand motivations, but their righteous paths will lead to inevitable collision, and I can't look away. P.S. My favorite line, looking strong, John, as, as Walker was getting his butt handed to him. Kay, you are, you are so right about that. Like, like Zemo's the big villain from, uh, from Civil War, but... Everything that's happening is proving that what he is saying about the super soldiers is absolutely right. Everything's going to hell. The flag smashers are now blowing up buildings with people in them and they're going to escalate. Hell, Carly, I bet you six months ago, Carly would never have phoned, you know, Sam's sister and threatened his sister's life and the lives of her children. And then John Walker, supposed to be a big American hero, and look what the super soldier serums are. I mean, he was broken already, but it's just kind of highlighting that. Now he's gone over the edge. It's, everything is proving that Zemo was kind of right. Everything Carly talking about, or she's right. They have been really wronged. Carly and, and the, the people the Flag Smashers represent have been very disserviced and very wronged. And what they're, they're justified to feel the way they're feeling, not to do what they're doing, but to feel what they're feeling, right? John Walker, if you, I mean, obviously we now know he goes over the edge and a lot of people who understood the comics knew that too. But when you're looking at him, he comes from a place of, there are terrorists out there. We need to do whatever we need to do to stop them. They're blowing up buildings. I have a job to do, you know? nothing is two dimension or is one dimensional. And I really do like uh, K the, the way they're handling that right now. All right. Next up, Nina smile writes, can we talk about the shock in Bucky's face after his arm fell off? Woo! must've felt like a betrayal. That's the word. The people who freed him didn't trust him enough not to put a safeguard into his main weapon. I, I the arms got to be able to come off somehow. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think the betrayal was that there is a way the arm can come off. I mean, if the arm can be put on, there's a way to take the arm off. Um, so I don't think that was the betrayal. The betrayal was that she would do it. The betrayal was that she would do it. And in that moment, that look on his face, when you juxtapose that look on his face, when Io gives him the little serpent death strike and the arm falls off, the look on his face of disillusionment and a little bit of betrayal and a bit of helplessness. Now juxtapose that against the start of that episode on the look on his face of joy and overwhelming emotional uh, emotion and happiness and gratitude for now he's healed. Now juxtapose that against the same person, Io, delivering both experiences. 
It's so deep, Nina. It's so deep. I absolutely love it. I absolutely loved it. All right, good observation. Next up, Michael Bradley writes, um, Hello, John. I really like digging into Walter, probably meant Walker's, Walker's breaking point. When he said they weren't even super soldiers, I knew he was close to breaking. And again, Michael, like we were saying a little bit earlier, every little rejection, every small failure, every little misstep has made that fire in him, that dangerous fire that's been burning and destroying everything inside of him has been burning hotter and hotter. And you're right. That moment after they had their asses handed to them by the Dora Milaje and, and he just looks bewildered and he's just like, it, it was like, it was, it was pure disillusionment. It was like the look on a, on a nine year old child. When you tell them there is no Santa Claus actually like, and, and just wait, they weren't even super soldiers. I am so far from what I thought I would be. And, and that scene, by the way, without that scene, I think a lot of us in the audience would question, would, would John Walker have really just done the illegal thing and just taken the super soldier serum? But because that event just happened, he just got his ass handed to him by non-super soldiers, just straight up beat it made that fire burn even more of what was left in him. And then when he does choose to take the, when we realized in the audience that he chose to take the super soldier serum, none of us doubted it for a second. None of us thought for a moment, ah, uh, would he have done that? None of us would have, would have thought that none of us did think that for a minute to us. It was the logical conclusion of everything we've seen happen to John Walker so far. If we hadn't, maybe we would have questioned it, but it was, it was very, very well executed, Michael. All right. Uh, Suthius writes, uh, with Bucky being, uh, deactivated, I couldn't tell if it was, let me try this again with Bucky being deactivated. If you're talking about his arm, I couldn't tell if he was getting emotional because he thought it wasn't working or if he was getting emotional because it was working with IO. Oh, you mean at, at the beginning of the thing? Yeah. At, at first it looked like he was struggling, right? As she's reciting the, uh, the trigger words, it looked like he was struggling and he was afraid of what would happen. And then when she gets to the end and he realized we've conquered this, we've beat it. That look on his face, the emotion that poured out, it was so special. It was so good, Suthius. It just created for a great moment. And I've heard from several people say, that's my favorite moment in the MCU. I've heard from people saying that scene, that flashback six years ago, scene to a, to a number of people is now like their favorite MCU moment. And it was a powerful, powerful moment, Suthius. It absolutely was. All right, Daniel Luna writes, Imagine being killed by a guy who's wearing and wielding a shield that represents something to you before. What an ending. Again, that flag smasher who just earlier in the episode, Daniel, saying that Captain America was his hero and now dying at the hands of a guy dressed like him and using Cap's shield to murder him on just such. Again, it was an almost perfect episode of television. It was almost a perfect episode of television. Uh, Chris Martinez writes, Walmart captain really reminds me of Harvey Dent from the dark Knight. The way we've seen him slowly, uh, seen him turn to the other side. Fantastic episode. Yeah. And I mean, to a lot of people, it's been inevitable. Like a lot of people were familiar with John Walker in the comics and us agent and all that kind of stuff. But even then watching it unfold, the way this show did a very, very good job of, of introducing us to this character that look at his core, this is a good man. He wants to do right. He wants to help people. He wants to save people, but he's not Steve Rogers. And we've seen those, that little bits of damage start to fester. We've seen those little insecurities start to become infectious. We've seen these things, little bits of ego that are in there become inflamed and then it all compounds with the death of his friend, the rejection by Sam and Bucky, and, and then the super soldier serum on top of all that. Heavy stuff, dude. Heavy, heavy stuff. All right. Uh, who was that? That was Chris, I think. Yeah, that was Chris. Next up, we've got Andrea uh, Valentova who writes, It seems to me Walker has was already damaged, I agree, by what he went through as a soldier when he probably already killed people in cold blood and even got medals for it. What do you think the government will do now? This has been the billion-dollar question for a lot of people, Andrea. 
I here's what I think. I don't know. They could go many different directions. They may look at what happened. We may find out in the next episode that the U.S. government sees this as a PR nightmare. They may strip him of the Captain America title, all that kind of stuff. But I have a feeling, and again, I this isn't based on anything. This is just me speculating as a fan. I wouldn't put any money on this. I, I have a feeling, though, that the government is going to back him. And they'll back him with the truth. Captain America stopped a terrorist, one of the terrorists responsible for blowing up that uh, GRC uh, building. Uh, one of the, a terrorist who just killed another American agent, his best friend, Battlestar, Captain America delivered justice. I have a feeling we might see the government take that route, which will only empower and embolden John Walker even more. Now, again, they might go the other way. They could go the other way and say, hey, this is a PR nightmare. You're no longer Captain America, which might make him go completely off the rails. But uh, we'll have to see where they go from there. All right. Josie Reviews writes, I believe the last shot of the show is Bucky and Sam with the shield. Also, how do you think Cap's number one fan, Ant-Man, feels about today's ending? Well, I mean, Scott knows that this isn't Steve Rogers, right? Scott knows that this isn't Steve Rogers. So I don't think he feels anything one way or the other, other than maybe pissed off at what they're doing to Cap's uh, legacy. But yeah, I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna see. I mean, look, at some point we know Sam and Bucky get the shield back. At some point that happens. Whether it's the final shot of the show, don't know. We'll have to wait and see. All right, next up, um, Mikey Lido writes. In Black Panther, T'Challa was was warned in Korea that the whole world was watching. That's right, when he was when he was going to kill um, Claw, uh, and now it comes to fruition in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Man, they always do a good job of tying thematically all these themes and all these events that have happened that have these juxtaposition like comparisons in the MCU. And you're right, Mikey Leto. That's exactly a very similar circumstance with a very different outcome. That's a great observation. Well said. All right, next up. Sean Stewart writes, I love that Zemo didn't take the serum. I agree. I love that he didn't take it. Uh, in comics or pretty much all comic book movies, he would have. Zemo in, the, in this show, Zemo in, in this show doesn't need it and holds true to his belief that the serum is wrong. I loved the reason, besides the fact that I'm sick and tired of everybody can run around and have superpowers now. The reason I love that he didn't take it was because they showed that Zemo really is true to his convictions. And villains who are true to their convictions are the scariest types of villains. They are the scariest kinds of villains. But his conviction was that serum is a plague. And he wasn't going to take it. He wasn't going to take it. He was serious about his conviction. I remember, and it's those things. See, that doesn't make me love Zemo. It's just that if he truly goes, if he goes full villain, it makes him all the scarier, right? Because he is so devoted to his convictions, even if they're misplaced convictions, but he's so devoted to his convictions, he would pass up the ability to have these superpowers because he's convicted. You know what it reminds me of? There was a show called Oz. I, it it might have been something else. You know, no, no. I, I think something similar happened in Oz, but that reminded me of another show or movie I saw once, and I can't remember which silver movie. So Oz had a similar situation, but I think it played out differently. But there was like this white supremacist, and he was in danger of dying unless he got blood transfusion, but the blood in the blood bank might have been from heaven forbid, a black guy. And he was just like, no, then I'm not going to take the blood transfusion. If I die, I die. And to me, see, that's not heroic. That's cowardly. But it, it also is like, that's what made that villain in that movie or show all the more like frightening is that whether it's, whether it's um, a Thanos or whether it's, you know, who's trying to destroy half the world or whether it's Zemo or whether it's something, or whether it's the operative in uh, played by Chiwetel Ejiofor in Serenity. Villains that have strong convictions and will not deviate from their convictions, I find all the more frightening, potentially evil, 
and terrifying. And that that part of Zemo, if he goes full bad guy, that one scene will always echo to me as one of the things that makes him truly, truly scary. But anyway, that's just kind of my take on it. All right, next up. Uh, Daniel Watts writes, One thing I noticed, 20 vials created, Carly used eight, and only seven were in her bag, leaving five. Um, Carly used eight, seven were in her bag, leaving five. And given Carly's reaction, the power broker probably has them. I, I, I mean, I don't know. Just because we saw X number, that doesn't mean that was only... Like, I'm not saying you're wrong. Don't get me wrong, Daniel. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying I don't... I wouldn't read that as gospel because of just what we saw on screen. Because it, just because we saw X number, that doesn't mean there weren't more. Or weren't more under, you know, Zemo's boot, whatever. Although it could be that, you know, Power Broker may still have one or two vials. We'll have to keep our eye open for that. I'm sure they'll get into that in the show. All right, Sam Fisher writes... Can we talk about the opening scene with Bucky finally gaining control of his mind? Uh, need more of Io and Buck interacting. Doesn't need to be romantic. I, you know what I love? I love when movies have a great bond and friendship between a male character and a female character, and they don't feel the need to make it a stupid romance. I love that. I was, And I was a little bit nervous after the flashback in Wakanda, and then they cut back to modern day with the two of them still standing in the street. I was afraid Bucky goes, you know, I love you so much. You know, I, I was kind of afraid of that and they didn't. And I really respected that. So yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing, first of all, just give me more of IO anyway, or give me more of the Dora Milaje in general. And I'm all for it. All right. Thanks for that, Sam. Next up, we got Suthius who writes, yeah, up until the end of far from home, we got Wanda, uh, taking an entire town hostage. We got a new cap, killing an armed, unarmed person in public, and we got Peter killing Mysterio. Not a good look for heroes. I mean, honestly, Suthius, if you want to now go back to WandaVision and look at Hayward, could anybody really blame Hayward for starting to, or anybody in the world for starting to develop maybe a little bit of a negative attitude towards heroes? I mean, yeah. Now, then again, I... No, 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 no. I take that back. I take that back. Because this Captain America hadn't killed those people yet. WandaVision happened first. So I take that back. But you're right about the Spider-Man thing. Nope. Not even right about the Spider-Man thing. That happens later too. So no, I take it all back. Take it all back. All he saw was what Wanda was doing. And what Wanda was doing was pretty messed up. Saw this Avenger, this superhero taking an entire town hostage to her own selfish desires and whims. I mean, it was it was pretty brutal. All right, next up. Uh, where are we? Sam Fisher writes, Are we going to see more of Isaiah? Maybe we'll see his reaction to the news when they show the murder the same way they showed Buck's reaction to Walker. You know, when they first showed us Isaiah, and some people were wondering if we were going to see, see Isaiah again, I initially said, no, nah, I don't think so. But as the week passed on, I changed my mind about that. I do think we're going to see him again. Now, I don't know that we're going to see him in a big, important role. I don't know that we're going to see him come into action. I don't know if it's just going to be a short thing. Maybe it's something. I don't know. But you know what? What you're saying makes perfect sense. What a scene that would be to show Isaiah watching a television and seeing what this new Captain America just did. That could be powerful, man. That actually could be pretty powerful. All right. Uh, Lady MO5 writes, I think this episode proves Zemo right. Uh, they should not be given that serum out. Very few people can handle that much power. And you know what? The funny thing is, I, I get the feeling that Bucky and Sam also agree. This, this serum should not be given out. I mean, Bucky had it, and look what he was used to do for almost 100 years. The only guy who was ever able to really deal with it was Steve Rogers. And you're right, we are starting to see more and more that Zemo was right about that. But then again, so were Bucky and Sam, because I think Bucky and Sam knew the Super Soldier Serum should not be handed out to people, at any rate. All right, Nerd on Film writes, John Wick writer Derek uh, Kolstad is writing the best episodes of this show. Carly was the only uh, flag smasher killing civilians. Uh, Walker's kill was pure murder. He doesn't know, nobody knows that. Nobody knows that Carly was the only one Killing. Nobody knows that. The flag smashers blew up that building. That's all anybody knows. 
That's all John Walker would have known. Now, listen, it was still pure murder. The guy was beaten and defeated, right? By the time he murdered him with the shield, the dude was down on the ground. He was helpless. He was beaten and he murdered him anyway. But um, John Walker had no idea. For, for all John Walker knew, this was the guy who planted the bomb. He didn't know that it was only Carly that did it. He didn't know that this guy had apprehension about blowing up the building. All he knew is that the Flag Smashers blew up the building. This was a Flag Smasher, and the Flag Smashers just killed my best friend. Still murder, though. Still pure blood and murder. All right. <coughs> Pardon me. Kung Fu Hot Dog writes, Hey, John. For the longest time, I said how Battlestar was a joke, but his death triggered me, and John Walker's reaction was justified. RIP Battlestar. Listen, I don't think what we're about to find out is how important Battlestar was. Specifically to John Walker. He was the guy who kept Walker on track. Even when they were having that debate with Sam and Bucky, and it was Battlestar who had to say, you know, Sam's got a point. And that's what kind of brought Walker back a little bit. Okay, well, if Battlestar's saying that, fine. You know, he was his North Star. And now he's gone. And I think we're going to see the repercussions of his death even more, you know, uh, viscerally as we move forward. All right. Good observation, Kung Fu. Next up, <coughs> Eddie M. writes, my reaction to the scene ending of Walker with his bloody shield. Well, he's not wielding Mjolnir anytime soon. Very true, Eddie. Very true. He will not be able to lift that hammer. No, sir. Uh, DGMC writes, did Battlestar remind anybody else of Kevin Hart? No, no, not even a little bit. As a matter of fact, nope, not even in the least. All right. Johnny Hustle writes, uh, I feel for Captain Wally. <laughs> he does look like Captain Wally, doesn't he? I feel for Captain Wally as well. Battlestar was a good dude, uh, but that flag smasher didn't blow anything up. Carly did it on her own and uh, and he told Walker it wasn't him and he gave up. That was wrong. Again, there is no way. <clears throat> There is no way Walker would have known that's true. There's no way Walker would have known that's true. <clears throat> and of course he would say, it wasn't me. Of course he'd say that. But you're right. That doesn't change the fact that he was beaten. He was helpless. He was defeated. And he was surrendered. And Walker just, just at that point, at that point, it became murder. It wasn't killed in action. This guy was beaten, defeated, and now helpless. At that point, killing him became murder. So, yeah, absolutely. Again, there's no way Walker would have known that he wasn't the guy who pulled the trigger to blow up the building. There's no way he would have known that. But even that was true. Even if he was the guy who blew up the building himself, he was beaten, defeated, and surrendered and helpless. At that point, it became murder. All right. Uh, just plain Steve writes, just throwing fuel on the fire. Yet another random European refugee recognized Sam. LOL. Love your show. Again, I, I didn't want to bring it up. I'm glad you did. Oh, look, everywhere Sam goes, he's in he's in Tunisia. And people walk up and do him the street. You're an Avenger. He's walking in the streets of Philadelphia. You're a black falcon. He's just there where is he again is in that random european refugee camp hi let me introduce myself i i know who you are you're sam wilson the falcon the event everybody knows who he is everywhere he goes except a club filled with criminals and underlord people none of them had any idea that that was uh, the falcon anyway i don't want to go into that again steve but you're right you're right. I believe me, that thought crossed my mind too. It's like, of course he just walks into a random refugee camp and everybody recognizes who he is. Of course they do. Anyway. Uh, all right. Next up, we got um, Kung Fu Hot Dog writes, John, I keep getting 1986 flashbacks of Kurt Russell whenever his son appeared on screen. Imagine Disney Plus in the 1980s and Kurt, Kurt playing John Walker. Kurt Russell, a younger Kurt Russell would have made a great, like back in Escape from L.A. days, or Escape from uh, New York, not Escape from L.A., uh, Escape from New York days, would have made a great uh, 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 John Walker. He would have made a great John Walker. Absolutely he would have been. Turns out he turned made a pretty good ego the living planet as well. But yes, he would have made a great John Walker. All right, next up. 
Moret Khan writes, So this is how people see new Captain America killed somebody, Wanda took hostages in a town, and Spider-Man killed an engineer. Things are really changing. Yeah, and I think all these things are going to have repercussions uh, as they move forward. I think these are all going to have big repercussions moving forward. We cannot forget the order in which they happen, but yeah, this could be changing the perception of the world when it comes to superhero. As If Civil War hadn't happened yet, if we already didn't already have, you know, Captain America Civil War, I would say this is leading us to the events of Civil War, of the Hero Registration Act and, you know, heroes having to come clean with their identities. It would almost feel like they were heading towards that, but of course we've already had it. But you're right, Murat, this is setting a tone for this post-Endgame MCU world, and it's not a good tone for them, my friends. Not a good tone for them. All right, next up, we've got, where are we at? We're at uh, Mason Hawking, who writes, I suspect Ralph Boner, Bonner, I guess was properly pronounced Bonner, was supposed to be in this episode, but but got circumcised from the episode. It's a, ah, ha, ha, Boner circumcised. All right, I'll, I'll give you the drum shot for that. Very good, Mason. Very good. I'll give you the drum shot for that one. All right. Uh, Miguelito writes, one of two. My theory is they're going to revoke Walker's status as Cap and confiscate the shield. He won't surrender it and will go off the deep end, possibly altering his suit to the comic accurate black slash red. Um, uh, final, or where are we? Yeah. Uh, finale going to be an all out Captain America free for all air horn. Sam gets a temp shield from IO uh, shield in the trailer CGI to look like Steve's. That's a possibility. Listen, the reason I like that uh, Miguelito is because we've seen the MCU pull that kind of stunt before. All we have to do is go back to Infinity War and they show Hulk running through Wakanda. Obviously, that doesn't happen. We see only certain stones in Thanos' glove. Obviously, that's not the way it was. So maybe, again, my feeling, and again, I'm not willing to put any money on this. I don't feel strongly about this. I'm just saying I'm kind of leaning towards I think the government's going to back him and say he stopped a terrorist, people who blew up buildings and killed one of our agents, his best friend, and he stopped them. He brought a terrorist to justice. I think that's the way they're going to play it. But it could very well go the way you're putting out, and you're right. That could just be another plain silver vibranium shield that they CGI differently for the advertising to be a little bit of a misdirect. Marvel has done it before. Maybe they're doing it again. If it happens, Miguelito, I'll remember you said that because that's a really, really good prediction. All right, next up. Um, at Lee Green writes, has the power broker already appeared on screen and we just don't know it? Love the show as always. Well, thank you, Atley. Um, the only theory I have right now, the only theory I have right now is that power broker is Sharon Carter. And I don't even, I don't feel strongly about that at all. I don't, I give it like a 20% chance, which means it's probably very unlikely, but it's the only theory I've got. I don't have any other theory about who the power broker is. I haven't heard every other theory that's been given. I don't, I, every other theory I've heard, I think is less likely than the Sharon Carter one, even though I don't think the Sharon Carter theory is very likely either, to be honest with you. But it's the only one I've got right now. We should get at least a big hint. If we don't actually get the full revelation of who Power Broker is in this next episode, I think we'll at least get a major hint or two. So I don't know. We'll find out, Atley. We'll find out, though. All right, thanks for that. Uh, Johnny Hustle writes, What a great acting performance by Wyatt Russell. You cannot overstate that, Johnny. You cannot overstate that. Like, the way we feel his pain and conviction and loss and going off the deep end is really a testimony to Wyatt Russell. He is he is delivering. He is absolutely delivering, and I'm glad you pointed that out. All right, Sam Wright writes, First scene, uh, next episode, Zemo climbing out of the drains outside of a nightclub. He escaped because he wanted to get back to dancing, not because of an evil plan. By the way, do you guys see the extended version? of uh, Zemo dancing in the club like better than that part was his like oh my god that was glo how smart is Disney's marketing by the way 
How smart is Disney's marketing, by the way, to put that out as their advertisement for the next episode of Falcon Winter Soldier? It was absolutely genius. Give me all that all day. All day, Sam. All right, next up, Purple Haze sends in like a $20 super chat. Thank you, Purple, for supporting our channel on that level, man. He writes, oh my God, when Bucky got his arm basically taken off in that episode, so awesome. And again, it comes back to this. We were saying this earlier, but I think this is another great example of that. Action without narrative purpose is just visual noise. But we just saw that scene where Io helped freed Bucky from his century-long imprisonment in his own mind. And the trust and the faith and the gratitude and all that kind of stuff. Now fast forward to modern day and they're at odds and she takes his arm from him. And the look on his face of, again, disillusionment, betrayal, maybe, disheartened, hurt. It was all done narratively. It's all done narratively. It was all a part of the narrative. And that's what made it so powerful. Because it was just it was just some random, let's say this, let's say it was, uh, I, I don't know, some, some average American soldier that came rushing in with you know, John Walker and everything. And he got in some kind of lucky shot that, that Bucky's arm falls off. That would have had, there would have been nothing special about that. Nothing special about that at all. But it was Io. Coming on the heels of what happened earlier, it was soaked in narrative. That piece of action was soaked in narrative and that's why it works so well. Great observation, Purple. Thanks for sending that in. All right, next up, we've got uh, Armchair Fandom who writes... Did not realize how attached I was to the legacy Steve created for the shield until I saw the book. I, I agree, right? Like they've been talking a lot about the the legacy of the shield, the symbolism of the shield. And it's like, okay, I get that theoretically, but I didn't feel it. When you saw John Walker then then standing there with blood on the shield, it's like, now I get it. Now I got it. Seeing the shield defiled. In that way, it really hit. That's why, again, I said like the image of Steve facing off against Thanos and his army was the was the picture that represented to me all of the MCU up until Endgame. This now is the picture that kind of represents the MCU to me right now. So yeah, that actually, I love the way you point the way you you kind of pinpoint that armchair. You're right. I felt the exact same way. Okay, next up, uh, Johnny Helser writes. Captain America defiled. That's what I was just saying. He completely defiled the shield. John. That's, the, that's the exact word I just used as well. All right. Dirk Walker writes, any chance the U.S. government fires Walker and gives Sam the shield back? Seems anticlimactic, but possible. Yes, very possible. But again, I kind of feel ever so slightly. Again, I'm not willing to put money on this. I feel like the government is going to back him on this, unfortunately. All right. James Gold writes. I feel a little manipulated by framing and use of blood. I've seen skill uh, Steve kill pirates on a ship in Winter Soldier. I don't know what Walker uh, that Walker did is worse. Oh, it's totally worse, James. I don't know how you don't get that. There is a difference between, you know, Captain America uh, trying to stop Hydra during World War II or trying to free hostages on a from pirates on a ship and in the course of action some of those pirates die you know, while trying to prevent him from rescuing these hostages. There is a difference between that and, you know, uh, Walker having a defeated, helpless, and surrendered enemy at his feet who is now no threat and just choosing, I choose just to murder you. I choose to kill you. There is, I got to disagree with you on that one, James. There is a massive, massive difference between those two scenarios. And I think that, is when that listen, if there was a big combat scene going on, and in the midst of that big combat scene, you know, this like some Walker did something that ended up killing the one flag smasher, I don't think that would have had the impact because it was in the midst of, of a conflict, it was in the midst of battle. He died in battle. This was not killing a guy in battle, the battle was done, the fight was over. He had him beat and he chose to kill him. And that is something we never saw Steve do. And that is something Steve would never do. And that's kind of the representation of it. All right. Johnny Hustle also writes, he was 100% wrong, Campia. He's an anti-villain. Oh, no doubt. The whole fact that he had him beaten and down and did it, he was 1,000% wrong. No doubt. All right. Next up. Marcus Walker writes, 
would be crazy if Dr. Christina Rayner, the, the therapist, was the power broker. Can't happen. Uh, she has ties with Bucky and Walker. Maybe Sharon is working for her. Here's the problem, though. The power broker is in Madripoor. And the therapist is never there. That's the big problem, too, with the whole idea. Some people have the theory that Thunderbolt Ross was the power broker. But the power broker is judge, jury, and king, executioner, and everything of Madripoor. And she's just simply not there. Just having connections to, uh, you know, Bucky and connections to Walker doesn't make her a candidate to be the power broker. Now, look, they could do something crazy and say it is, but I just don't think the logic of it lines up. Could be wrong, though. Could be wrong. All right, next up. Uh, Lucifer ZL1 uh, sends in like a hundred dollar super chat, dude. Thank you so much for supporting the channel on that level. I am overwhelmed. Thank you, man, very, very much. That is incredibly generous. Let's see what you had to say. That again, again, from all of us who participate and even watch the John Campia YouTube channel, thank you for supporting the channel on that level, man. Anyway, uh, Lucifer ZL1 writes in other news. Uh, Sam and Bucky were caught breakdancing in their hotel room. I, I listen that whole sequence, man. That whole sequence, and maybe, maybe in some alternate cut at some point, we find out that they were so inspired by the moves Zemo showed in the club that they went on to something else. Uh, nice image you just planted in my head. I'm gonna have a hard time getting out of there, Lucer. Anyway, again, man, th thank you for supporting our channel that l level, dude. That is so very generous, and thank you for supporting us, Dad. All right, let's move on. The Jughead One writes, uh, greetings, John. Love and respect to you from the UK. Thank you, my friend. Uh, from your Nigerian brother. Uh, you are correct. The US will back John. He neutralized the terrorists. I, and I, I again, I know I'm not saying that's the approach the U.S. government should take in Falcon and Winter Soldier. I just feel like that's the one they will take. Remember how they even introduced him. We have the Avengers to defend the world, but we need a hero that defends America. Remember? And I think that mentality, and it's not a big stretch because you can sell this. Remember, not everybody saw the actions unfold the way we as the audience on television got to see it go down. So you can totally sell these events as Captain America heroically brings one of the international terrorists to justice. That's totally how they could spin this. It's totally how they could sell it, and it's not a far stretch. So I agree with you, Jughead One. I think that's what they're going to do. Now, I, again, I'm not, I don't know that that's what they're going to do. I'm not like wholeheartedly stone cold conviction that that's what they're going to do, but I kind of feel like that's the way they're going to go. We will find out though. We will find, I think we're going to find out this next episode, what they're going to do about that. All right. Pit 83 writes, could R Romolo, who was uh, uh, crossbones, uh, who was Hydra and tried to blow up cap and Wanda in civil war, be the power broker or did Wanda kill? No, no. Romolo is dead. Um, he, he died in, um, in civil war at the beginning of civil war. So that's now, of course, this is the Marvel fake death universe, but I don't see how a grunt foot soldier like, uh, like him would be the power broker. I, I don't see how they would spin that. Not to mention the implication seems to be that the power broker has been active in Madripoor for a long time. I don't know how long, but I kind of get doubt would be, it would be him though. Although Frank Grillo, I would love to see Frank Grillo back, but I, uh, they, they pretty definitively killed him, but I don't know. We'll see, we'll see where they go with that. All right. Uh, Edward David writes, come on, John power broker, go back to Ant-Man and the Wasp. You never meet him, but there was a secret character trying to get a hold of Hank Pym's tech. True. I was funny. You mentioned that we were just talking about that a little bit earlier. We were talking about that scene, about a, a scene where the narrative really wasn't, you know, all that prevalent in the action. So it's funny you bring that up anyway. I don't know. Does does the power broker really deal too much outside of Madripoor? I don't know. Are they saying that that's the one and the same person? Ah, uh, I don't know. I'm going to guess it's not. But you know what, Edward? I say that now. But they could draw a connection between that. Because you're right. They never really truly say who is Walton Goggins working for. You know what? I, I will stick with I doubt it, but it's not a crazy... Now that I think about it, it's not crazy. Okay, so I'll still say I doubt it, but 
there's more that's more legitimate than I initially gave it credit for. Let, let's think on that a little bit longer, Edward. Maybe they'll play that out that way. All right, next up. Uh, Lady MO5 writes, Walker has Battlestar's blood on his hands. Absolutely does. As well, his pride had him blocking Sam's plan and then challenging Sam to a fight. Walker is not a hero. I agree. He wants, but I still believe what really fleshes this character out is the fact that he wants to be a hero. He sees himself as the hero. His initial motivations are generally right, but all those things we talked about, the previous damage he probably already had, with the burning expectations, his own desires, fueled on that now by major loss, and of course the fact that he has the super soldier serum now, it just compounds to make a really bad mix for John Walker. So I agree. I agree. I just think he's he's such a multi-dimensional character because of all those other things as well. So yeah. Anyway, Gabe Campbell writes, Sam and Bucky versus Zemo versus the Dora Milaje versus the Flag Smashers versus John Walker. Next episode is going to be incredible. That might be an episode six situation, Gabe. That could be an episode six, but you're right. It could play out in episode five. But I think you might be right. It could be episode five, and then the final episode could be conflict with the power broker. And we find out really who and what the power broker is. So the power broker could ultimately be the final, like the last level boss. Maybe. We'll we'll see, though. We'll see. Eddie M writes, what if a power broker is a scrawl? Love your show, John. Well, if the power broker is a scrawl, then the power broker is a scrawl. Uh, I don't really see how any connection there, but yeah, if the power broker is a scroll, the power broker is a skull. We'll find out. All right, next up, Edward David. By the way, let me throw this out there again. I often, we fortunately, people haven't done this in a long time. If you ever start off a question with what if, there has to be a question attached to it, right? So, okay, what if the power broker is a scroll? Because the answer to that is just then the power broker is a scroll. But you got to make sure if you start a question with what if, then make sure you add an actual question to it. So, for instance, in this, what if the power broker is a scroll? Does that mean there would be a chance that Nick Fury could be uh, could be involved and trying to stop that guy already? What if the power broker was a scroll? Would that mean that he's actually dealing out alien technology? What if the power broker was a scroll? Would that mean it's going to be almost impossible to identify him because he could shapeshift? Like, if you're going to start off a question with what if, you got to make sure it ends with an actual question. Don't just leave it hanging. Because the answer to what if power broker is a scroll is, then the power broker is a scroll. So, I'm not really sure. I, again, I really don't think they're going to bring scrolls into this one. Like, in WandaVision, it made sense because of the inclusion of Monica Rambeau. That made, narratively, it to make sense with the scrolls being involved. I don't see anything here at all. Uh, the involvement of a scroll here in this in, in Falcon Winter Soldier now would be so random and so disconnected from everything. So I, I don't see it happening here, but you never know. It's a possibility. All right. Edward David writes, Sharon can't be the power broker. Oh, she could. Uh, why did she have to kill all those mercenaries in the shipyard if she was the power broker? Don't know. But that doesn't disprove anything. Just because you don't have an answer to a to a dangling question is not proof of the contrary to the to the hypothesis, right? We don't know why she would do that. Hell, why did Casanova Frank remember Casanova Frankenstein? See, I kill my own men. You good guys, but see me, I kill my own men. I mean, maybe it's part of that. Maybe it's not, I, the answer is we don't know what the answer is. We don't know why she did that. But the answer of that absence of that question, I mean, the absence of that answer is not in and of itself proof to the contrary of the hypothesis. And again, remember, I'm still saying I think it's unlikely that she is. I just haven't heard a better theory yet. I have not heard a better theory. Doesn't mean I think she is the power broker. I just think out of all the theories I've heard, the theory put forward by some people that Sharon is the power broker is the one that makes more sense to me than any of the other theories. So if you got a better theory... I'm all ears. I don't personally have a better theory myself yet. Maybe you do. I'd love to hear it. All right, next up. Uh, two Watcher writes, Unapologetic Walker stood tall and put Carly and her supporters on notice. He is not Steve Rogers, and that means something completely different now. It means he's going to be a tyrant. And he is a tyrant. 
I, I, and it, one of the greatest examples of that was not just the murder of a completely defeated and helpless and unarmed opponent, but the other part was this. Sam was getting close to de-escalating the whole conflict. Sam was getting very close. He was making progress in his conversation with Carly. He was making real headway. And who knows if they had allowed that conversation to play out, how far it would have gone and how much they actually would have accomplished. The real Captain America would have given Sam every moment of time that he needed. Walmart Captain America souped up on super soldier serum, his own ego, his insecurities, his failures up until that moment, just wouldn't stand it. All he knows how to do is to go in and throw punches. That's the only thing he knows how to do. To him, that's the job. So... You're right. He put the world on notice that things were different now. But the way things are different is that he is indeed a now a tyrant. Now he's a tyrant, and that's the way things are different. All right, let's move on now. Uh, next up, we've got Gabe Campbell who writes, um, that ending gave Civil War flashback of Cap versus Tony. Oh, absolutely, and, and that was on purpose. Again, we alluded to that earlier, right? It It shows us, it juxtaposes the difference. Both Captain Americas, with the shield, have their enemy and opponent defeated and beat and now helpless before them. One spares him and then gives him a cell phone later, say, call me whenever you need me, buddy. And the other murders him. It's a complete, on-purpose, very deliberate comparison. It's a good observation, Gabe. Ben Rayner writes, I guess one could say Bucky got disarmed. What was that, CSI Miami? I guess he could say that he was disarmed wow there very go i'll give you the drum shot for that one too ben there you go all right courtney haynes writes over under 30 percent what happened to steve rogers is a major plot point in the last two episodes i think it may be revealed but not sure it'll be a big part of the plot i'm going to say under 30 percent courtney because i agree with that last part that you said i do believe we are going to hear where is Steve Rogers right now? Because he didn't die. He's out there somewhere. Just, you know, enjoying the the, you know, his retirement, whatever. But I don't think it's going to be a key thing. Like, I don't think this is going to be a dark night um uh return sort of thing. It's not going to be a nightfall conclusion. You know what I mean? Like when Bane broke Batman's back. Batman went out and got Jean-Paul Valley to come in and got Azrael to come in and be Batman. But by the end of that storyline, once Bruce Wayne's back was now not broken anymore, he realized Azrael playing Batman has gone too fanatical, has gone too violent, and finally he has to fight him himself and they have to fight and Bruce has to beat Azrael. I don't think um, that we're going to get Old man Steve Rogers, you know, John Walker, I was a soldier like you, but you've disgraced my shield, and now I'm going to give you a whooping. You know, I I don't think that's going to be the case. Although I would love it. God, I would love that. If actually old man Steve showed up and kicked John Walker's ass, I would, I would freak out. I'd be like, seriously, urine flying all over the place. John would be just lose all control of his bowels. It would just be insane. I would love it. All right. Anyway, uh, but, but yeah, I'm going to take the under 30% of that, Courtney. All right. Uh, then Cat Ram Saran writes, um, eight super soldier terrorists. Doctor said 20 were stolen, but Car uh, Carly's only got seven in the bag at the cemetery. Again, somebody else brought that up. I'm not really clear how many there are out there. I don't know what they're implying. And maybe like somebody else kind of brought up that maybe the power broker is already in possession of a couple of them. I think we're going to get some more definitive, clear answers on that in episode five. Because again, there are a crazy uh, Venkat, but there are only two episodes left. But I think we will get an answer to that uh, moving forward here. All right, next to what? Next up. Antoine Fair writes, I thought Sharon was the power broker since the dock fight, because if he was the top dog, how she get to go back to the city with him knowing she killed his guys uh, to to yes, he a terrorist, but he was surrendering and he still killed him. 
I, I, I think you're talking about two different things there. But yes, the share thing. See, somebody else, this is why we, we got to be careful to make definitive statements of fact when we really don't know what's happening, right? So like somebody just earlier wrote in and said, well, she can't be the power broker because why was she taking out those guys? Well, the answer is we don't know. But see, to somebody else from a different point of view, it's like, well, she must be the power broker. Can't get away with killing all the power brokers' men and just get away with it unless you are the power broker. So, and again, I don't know if either are true. I don't know, but I just think that the answer is we don't. But Antoine, you just gave a really good example about how we can look at the same event and two completely different ways. We just have to acknowledge we don't know what the answers are yet, and it's still a little bit of a coin toss. And again, I'm not saying that she is the power broker. I'm just saying I haven't heard a better theory yet. That's just me. All right. Evelyn writes, I love how Bucky had uh, zero, zero, you probably meant zero intention of getting in the fight between Io and Walker until Sam asks him. Uh, the looking good John was so funny. Looking strong, John. That Somebody else mentioned that one too a little bit earlier, Evelyn. I love, I that put a real quick look on but at the same time, it made me feel kind of sorry for John. Again, that's the brilliance of the writing of this character. He's clearly going off the deep end, and he has gone off, off the deep end. But you can't help but feel bad for him at the same time. Like, that really crushed him, the fact that he lost to non-super soldier people in the Dora Milaje. It crushed him, and I kind of felt sorry for him. All right, Alex Knight writes, Walker has an inferiority complex. He really does. And you saw it growing and developing throughout the show. Ironic that he idolized and aspired to be as good as Rogers, but ended up becoming everything that he fought against. And that is a brilliant observation, Alex. In wanting so badly to live up to the legacy of Steve Rogers, he ends up becoming the antithesis and the opposite of what Steve Rogers was and represented. And I think the way you just worded that, Alex, was perfect. It is a perfect analogy for exactly what's going on here. And it's a part of John Walker's tragedy. I really think he did want to be like Steve Rogers. But in the do whatever it takes to do that, he actually it becomes the opposite and everything that Steve Rogers stood against. And again, that just adds to the tragedy of John Walker. And I, and I really believe that. I believe this is the tragedy. This is a real tragedy. All right. Final question, guys, and then we're all wrapped up here. Uh, this one comes to us from Robert Gonzalez, who writes, Do you think Cap taking the serum will be known to others or kept between Sam and him? Also, what are your thoughts on how the season may finish with Sam and Bucky dealing with their problems at home? I, I'm not really sure about that. I just want to let that part unfold. As far as will other people know that he's got the super soldier serum? It depends on if, if, if he was caught on camera because there were a lot of eyewitnesses there to see him jump out of the eighth story of a building, come flying down and do the superhero landing on the car and all that kind of stuff, right? So I have a feeling other people will know. I, I don't know that yet. We won't know that for sure until the next episode. But my, uh, I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess that, yeah, somebody got that on, on camera. Or at least there were witnesses. I mean, there's a lot of people standing around. Whether they were rolling their cameras already or not, a lot of people saw it. Sam and Bucky know exactly what happened. All that kind of stuff. So I'm going to think people know. I, I don't know that for sure. It's a very good question, Robert. I'm surprised nobody else asked that. Actually, it's a great question. Because that the answer to that question will kind of determine the way a lot of this goes moving forward. But yeah, it's a good one. I'm going to guess that people will know, though. We'll find out, though at the beginning of the next, or, or yeah, sometime in the beginning of the next episode. All right, guys, that will now do it for the part one and part two of our Falcon and Winter Soldier episode four open spoiler discussion. Guys, thank you so much for participating in this. I, I, I learned so many things and I bought into so many of your theories. Thank you so much for sending in all the messages. Number one, because you give us great fun things to talk about and you actually gave us new theories. But number two, you support this channel while you do at the same time. And all of us here involved with the John Campia show, thank you guys very, very much 
for that support. Okay, guys, don't forget the John Campus Show returns again tomorrow. That's Monday morning. Me and Robert Meyer Burnett, please come on by and join us for that. And of course, on top of the regular episodes of the John Campus Show, we've got our new editorial video coming up in the next couple of days called The Five Worst Things. Even though you know I had a great time watching Kong versus Godzilla. It ain't perfect, so I've got a video coming called The Five Worst Things About Kong vs. Godzilla. And then, of course, on Friday again, we will have our open spoiler discussion. Only two episodes left of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Episode 5. Guys, that'll do it for me for now. Thanks a lot for being here. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.